Welcome once again to Calvary Chapel Northwest, our Sunday service and Communion Sunday. Before we get started, I have a little story I want to tell you. Really has nothing to do with anything spiritual. I can't even attach a spiritual meaning to it. Just a, a grandpa story. This morning, my two little granddaughters, three years old, are in my room, and they, they're playing hide-and-go-seek, right? They're barely, barely taller than the, the mattress on the bed, right? So one of them is standing behind the mattress of the bed. The other one goes into the living room, right? And then she's like, where are you? Where are you? And then she comes in there, and she finds her, and she's like, I found you. My turn. So she stands there, and then the other one goes in the living room, and they just do this like 30 times, you know, just swapping space. It's not very good at uh, hide and go see, but cute, cute as can be. Grandpa story, taking advantage of the pulpit to give grandpa stories. Uh, good thing about being a pastor is that nothing bad ever happens when you're a pastor, right? This morning, uh, I go to uh, get in my car so I could go pick up the drinks for the Agape Love Feast, and my battery is dead, right, dead. So I jump the car, go to Walmart to get what I needed to get, and of course, my battery didn't automatically become healed in the trip from my house to Walmart, so I had to jump it again, you know, but um, these things are designed to try us, right? So we, we praise God. It's, it's always great when we get in the, in the presence of God, when we gather with the saints and the worship starts. It's just something different about being in that environment. And I'm like, oh, Lord, this is special. And, and it's going to be like a million times better when we get to heaven. And, and that's going to be constant. So we look forward to that. We're continuing our study in the book of Romans today. And our text is, uh, is a, a large one. We're starting in chapter 10, verse 16, and we're going to go through chapter 11, which is uh, 1136. So if you will turn there in your Bibles, due to the length of our text, I'm not going to read the text in its entirety as I usually do before we start the study. I will just read it as we go through and study it. So if you will, please join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can gather once again as the body of Christ, that we can gather, Lord, as your family, as your children, Lord, and that, Lord, we can behold wondrous things from your word. So, dear God, as I surrender my voice to you, I ask, Lord, that you would speak your words through me. I ask, Lord, that you would fill the hearts of your people to overflowing with your spirit, that each heart would be attentive to what you have for them today. And dear God, I pray, Lord, if there's any in our midst or listening online that does not know you as Savior, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity for them to hear your word, Lord God, and to surrender their lives to you and be born again today. And I ask that that would happen, Lord, to the glory of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our text begins chapter 10, verse 16 through 18. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now, Paul is talking about the nation of Israel here as he quotes Isaiah 53, verse 1, in verse 16, and he quotes Psalms 19, verse 4, 
in verse 18. But in between those two verses, we have the phrase in verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We talked about this in our study last week. There is power in God's word. It, it's not through human arguments and persuasion which results in the faith necessary for salvation. It is the power of God's word. God's word accomplishes what he sends it to do. But God has given man free will. And with that free will, mankind can choose to be stubborn and to be disobedient to God's word. And that is the point here. The point is that Israel had all that she needed in order to believe. Just as Psalms 19.4 speaks of universal accountability because of God's general revelation, the heavens declare the glory of God. Israel was accountable because they had the word of the prophets which spoke even more clearly and directly than God's general revelation. There was and there is no logical reason for Israel to reject her Messiah. The word of God which they had in their hands pointed to Jesus with absolute clarity and specificity. Paul moves on to further his argument of Israel's accountability in verse 19. But I say, did Israel not know? For Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Here, Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 32, verse 21, and Isaiah 65, verse 1 through 2. The gospel of Jesus Christ has at the time of Paul writing this has been preached throughout the land that God promised Israel and also throughout Rome where many Jews lived. The Jews have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have witnessed the power of the gospel as Gentiles embraced an intimate relationship with their God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The very words spoken by Moses were being fulfilled before their very eyes. Yet instead of being moved by jealousy toward God, they fulfilled Isaiah's pronouncement. They are indeed a disobedient and contrary people. If you have spent any considerable amount of time reading through the Old Testament, this is no shock to you. Kellyanne and I are going through the book of Hosea in our devotions together. And as we read through Hosea, we just shake our head. After every chapter, we are amazed at how the children of Israel, whom God has done so much for, continually rebels, how they treat God. And, and our prayer after every uh, study, after every devotion is, Lord, let our hearts never grow so cold to where we treat you in that way. Chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. 
God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. You see, the good news about Israel's history of unfaithfulness to God is that it reveals God's love and God's mercy. It reveals God's faithfulness to those whom he has made promises to regardless of their lack of reciprocation. God is faithful. His faithfulness does not change. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God's very nature is faithfulness. As Hebrews 13.8 proclaims, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Elijah, looking at the vile rejection of God by God's own people, cries out, I am the only one left, Lord. They've killed your prophets and thrown down your altars. Just think about what Elijah is describing. This isn't a casual ignoring of God. This isn't, I'm not going to go to church because I'm going to stay home and watch football, or I'm going to go fishing. No, this isn't casual. This is actively opposing God by destroying places of worship and killing God's messengers. But God responds with assurance. No, Elijah, you're not the only one. I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to bow. There is always a remnant, always a remnant. Sometimes that remnant is very small. At the height of the wickedness of all of mankind, that remnant was only eight people, Noah and his family. That was the remnant. The entire rest of the world was lying in wickedness. And depending on how long God tarries before he takes the body of Jesus Christ out of this world in the rapture, I believe that that remnant may again be quite small. Verse 5, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But it, if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. The remnant on earth that exists right now is those who have accepted God's free gift of salvation, which is Jesus himself. The election of grace is the new covenant. The election of grace is the gospel. The election of grace is the call and choosing of the whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Paul himself was a part of the election of grace, and he served as an example that God has not cast off his earthly people. Israel was called to participate in the election of grace. But like so many people who struggle with coming to faith in Jesus, because coming to faith in Jesus is just too simple. 
Salvation requires no effort. In fact, it is the opposite of effort. It is when we give up on what we can do and we simply surrender to God and receive the gift that was provided by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is then we are saved. There are no works or else it would not be grace. A great example in scripture of the struggle to accept the, the gift of God can be seen in the story of Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army. His story is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was a great military leader, but Naaman was a leper. Fortunately for him, he had a wife who had a servant girl, which was a captive from Israel. This Israelite servant girl told Naaman's wife that there was a prophet in Israel who could help him. So to make a long story short, Naaman eventually ends up at the prophet Elisha's house. He's at Elisha's doorstep. Now, you need to understand that Naaman is a big deal. He's a huge deal. So much so that the king of Syria had in advance sent a letter to the king of Israel saying, I'm sending Naaman, the leader of my army, to you so you can have him healed of his leprosy. Naaman shows up with his great entourage at the door of Elisha, the prophet. Elisha don't even answer the door. He sends his servant. He sends his servant to the door with a message for Naaman. Go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. Sounds simple enough, right? Go wash in the Jordan. Seven times you'll be healed of your leprosy. Simple. This is the word of the Lord from the prophet Elisha. It's simple. Just like salvation in Jesus. Jesus shed his shed blood, his precious blood to pay the awful price for your sin, for my sin. You know that you are a sinner and that you are separated from God. You know when you are seeking righteousness with God through self-righteousness or religious pursuits. Stop. Surrender. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. That's how simple it is. But how does Naaman respond to simplicity? Let's read it. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy, or not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. That's how powerful people act, isn't it? And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? How much more than when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. 
and he was clean. See, Naaman had a preconceived notion about how God would heal him. He was expecting the dramatic, but all that was required was simple faith. All he needed to do was believe the word of God spoken by Elisha. And true belief, saving faith, is validated by action. As James says, faith without works is dead. Naaman had to be convinced, but he finally believed. How do we know he believed? Because he did it. Faith without works. He did it. The act of obedience was validation of his faith. He believed and he completed the simple instruction and he was cleansed. This problem is so common with so many. We want salvation on our terms instead of God's terms, which really boils down to the fact that we don't believe. The rich young ruler in the Bible whose story is found in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18, is a perfect example of this. This rich young ruler was a very religious man. He was a morally pure man. But when he confronted Jesus, asking Jesus, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He wasn't really looking for anything to do. He was looking for the validation that what he was already doing was good. You know, certainly Jesus is going to say, oh, you're good to go. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus reached right down to the issue of his heart. And he said, oh, you lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. He didn't do it. He couldn't do it. The Bible says he went away sad because he had great wealth, great treasures, great possessions. The Bible says this, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Jesus wasn't enough. He did not believe that Jesus was enough. Had he believed, he would have obeyed. And this was the problem with Israel. They just could not accept the transition from the law, which required so much, to simply receiving salvation by faith. Verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Israel did not obtain the right standing with God that she sought because she did not seek it by faith. The elect, those who are the whosoever believes, they have obtained it. Verse 8, just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back. Always, when people willingly reject what God has presented to them, they become hard of heart, dull of hearing, and blind of sight. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, 
salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? It's clear throughout the word of God that God not only has the capacity, but also the desire to turn that which is ugly, that which is bad and sinful, to something which is glorious. God can do that because nothing takes God by surprise. God knew that Adam would blow it. He knew that Adam would allow sin and destruction into the world. But God was prepared. Jesus was already destined to come and die for the sin of the world even before he created the world. God knew that Israel, the people whom he chose to bring forth the Messiah, the people to whom he made promises to, would reject the very Messiah that they should have been waiting for and ready to receive for their entire lives. But God planned that he would use their fall to usher in this wonderful age of grace in which all of us who are saved have been saved in this age of grace. We all have our stories of brokenness and sin. But God, I have mine. So many ways that I've failed in my life. But God, the blessings of God that are on my life that I absolutely do not deserve. But God, and you have your story. You know where you have come from. You know that you don't deserve all that God has given you. But God, God has intervened in our lives and made us trophies of his grace throughout the ages and ages to come in eternity, God will look at us as exhibit A of his love, his mercy, and his grace. Those things that the world, the flesh, and that the devil intends for evil, God intends for good. Paul goes on to say, if God can make the fall of Israel something that becomes glorious for the world, how much more glorious when Israel is restored to God? Verse 16, for if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, Branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, 
severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Whole lot of imagery there. Let me break it down for you. Jesus is the first fruit. Jesus is the root. The original branches is the nation Israel. The new wild branches that were grafted in are the Gentile nations. All things that extends from Jesus, the root, is holy. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that in Christ, we are the righteousness of God because we extend from the root, from the original lump. Paul wants the elect of grace to maintain proper perspective. The natural branches, Israel, were broken off because of unbelief. Again, their failure to transition from the law to grace. Galatians 3, 24. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law did its job. Any honest person would recognize their failure to perfectly keep the law. The whole Old Testament system of atoning sacrifice points to the individual's failure to be able to fulfill the law. When Jesus came into the world and shed his blood, the transition should have been seamless, but instead, Israel's response was unbelief. Those natural branches, Israel, were broken off, and the wild branches, the Gentiles who were willing to accept the grace of God, were grafted in. Paul wants the Gentile nations to understand that they too can be cut off through unbelief. Unfortunately, the cutting off through unbelief is already happening, and it will continue to happen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, describes the last days. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. This describes the time that we are living in presently. We, in my opinion, are moving at breakneck speed to the end of this age of grace. Verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. 
And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Israel as a nation has rejected the Savior. And as a result, they are blind. In this age of grace, the overwhelming majority of recipients of God's grace are Gentiles. But when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, God's focus will once again turn to Israel. When is that? Well, the event that happens to mark this transition is the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. Ah, I was hoping. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In this present age of grace, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. When all who will come to faith in Jesus receives him by faith, which includes Jews, but primarily Gentiles, Jesus will return for his church. The tribulation will commence and God will again focus primarily on the salvation of the nation Israel. Verse 28. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. The reality is that Israel is presently an enemy of the gospel. They were in Paul's day, and they continue to be in this day. They are antagonistic to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are lost in sin. God still loves Israel, and God has not abandoned them because God does not give up on those whom he loves. Just as you, when you were unsaved, God continued to pursue you until you came to your senses and surrendered your life to Jesus. God will continue to pursue Israel into the tribulation where they will finally turn to the Lord in mass and be saved. Verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him? And it shall be repaid to him. Isaiah 55. Verse 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What does that mean? God's in control. We can trust him. We can totally depend on God. God works all things after the counsel of his own will. 
our final verse, verse 36. Look at this verse intently. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. It is all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all about Jesus. Jesus is the one who makes God the Father known to us. Jesus is the express image of God the Father. You want to know God? God gave us Jesus to know God. Know Jesus, God the Son, and you know all that God is. If you know Jesus, you know God the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. To know the Father, you need to know Jesus. The whole scripture is about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, the Word of God, is God Almighty. One God manifest in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And that God has invited you to have relationship with him. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. Jesus didn't come to create churches so you could check the block on a Sunday. Jesus came to bring you into a personal relationship with himself by suffering on a cross and paying the penalty, the eternal penalty of God's wrath on your sin and on my sin. If you're here today and you know him as your savior, as we approach the communion table, I invite you to examine your hearts, make sure you are right with God, make sure there is no distance between you and God. And if there is anything, as you cry out, search me and know me, see if there is any unclean way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. As you search your heart, confess your sin and get right with God in this moment. If you are here and you do not know Jesus as your Savior, if you do not know the intimacy of absolute, complete surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity to receive him as your Savior now. Let's go before the throne of God and conduct business. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the unspeakable gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Dear God, now as we approach your table of communion, I ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you speak to every heart that is under the sound of my voice. That, Lord, you open each heart to receive you as Lord and Savior. Unsaved and saved. We all, Lord, need to receive you as our Lord and Savior to be in an intimate relationship with you, Lord God. Those, Lord God, struggling to surrender to you for the first time, 
I ask, Lord God, that you would just overwhelm them with faith and grace, that they would realize that there is nothing that they can hold on to in this world that is worth an eternity apart from you. The Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I know you know that Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross. You know that he was buried and that on the third day he rose from the grave. That he was with his disciples and seen of many witnesses for 40 days and then ascended into the heavens and sat down on the right hand of God the Father. Your sin has been taken care of. You simply need to receive the gift, which is Jesus himself. Surrender your life to him right now. Cry out from your heart, Lord Jesus, I want you as my Savior. I turn from my own ways. I turn from my own path, and I surrender to you. Save me. If you pray that prayer in earnest, you will know that you are saved. You will know that you belong to him. You will have the witness of the Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you, Lord, for doing your work. Lord Jesus, I thank you for doing what human words cannot do. Only your spirit can draw someone to you and bring them to salvation, and I thank you for that. Now as we approach your table, Lord, we come to honor you and worship you in your holy name. Amen. If you don't have elements, please raise your hand and an usher will bring you them. I want to remind you that this is a family celebration. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, then it would be best if you just let the elements pass by. Of course, we would love you to be the guest of honor as Jesus calls out to offer you the free gift of salvation. Jesus was having the Passover meal with his disciples. And at that meal, he took bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he told his disciples, this is my body. Broken for you. It wasn't Jesus' actual body. Obviously, he was still in his body. It was representative of his body. This doesn't become Jesus' body. This is representative of his body that was broken for us. Isaiah tells us that it pleased God the Father to, to crush him because the wages of sin is death. There was a price that needed to be paid in order for me to be able to have a relationship with a holy and sinless God. And that price was what Jesus suffered in his body on the cross. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. As oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember our Lord's broken body. In that same meal, Jesus took the cup. 
which wasn't hermetically sealed. <laughs> and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. That's what we've been talking about today in our message. The election of grace. The new covenant where salvation is free to whosoever will. This is the blood, Jesus said, of that new covenant. The blood that Jesus shed on Calvary's cross. He says, as often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Let us do likewise. Jesus told his disciples that the next time that he drank of the cup with them would be in heaven at his father's table, the marriage supper of the Lamb. I look so forward to drinking this cup with Jesus on that day. We live in a dark world that is growing darker, but we have the light of the sun in our hearts. There is nothing that can overcome us because we are in Christ, and I'm so grateful for that. Lord, I thank you for who you are. Lord, we honor you with these elements. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory in your most holy, wonderful, and magnificent name, Lord Jesus. And we cry out from our hearts, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Please stand and join us with a final worship song before we dismiss.